So there's really only one more concept to discuss in Lewis structure drawing, and it's the idea of formal charge. Now, we brought up the idea of resonance on Monday, the idea that I have a double bond, where does it go? Or I have, in this case, two extra bonds. How do I assign those two extra bonds? Do I split them up evenly? Or do I put them all on one side or all on the other? And if the choice were arbitrary, didn't matter what we did, then yes, we would consider those resonance structures and we could draw them as resonance structures and know that that bond is just moving around. But in the case of nitrous oxide here, N2O, we don't have that option. These three molecules are distinctly different from each other. The choice to go with one or another of these is not a simple one, not an arbitrary one. So how do we know which one is correct? Can we know which one is correct? This is where formal charges come in. Now, some things that we need to know about formal charges. We've already discussed oxidation states. Oxidation states are real. They describe real electronic environments around those atoms. Formal charges are not. Formal charges are a bookkeeping mission to help us try to identify the best structures. They really don't exist as true charges in the same way that oxidation states do. Now, your book is going to present this equation as the method for calculating formal charge. And it's, it's okay. The problem with it is that I think it suffers from unnecessarily being complex. What we want is we want something that we can easily look at a structure, know exactly how many of each kind of electron there are and be able to do the math in our head quickly. And the problem is when we start trying to count lone pairs of electrons versus shared electrons, we got to do a lot of multiplying and dividing in our head, easy to make mistakes. So I'm going to give you a different form of this equation. Formal charge is equal to valence electrons minus dots, minus bonds. When I look at the formal charge, I can count how many dots are around a given atom. That's easy. I don't have to multiply that by two. I don't have to look at how many lone pairs there are. I can just look, okay, this nitrogen right here it's got two dots around it. I can also look at this nitrogen and see that it has three bonds. It's formal charge, five for nitrogen, minus two dots, minus three bonds, would be a zero formal charge. So, that's how we calculate the formal charge on an individual atom. Now, how do we use that information? If possible, the best structure that we can get is the one that has formal charges of zero all the way across. And that's why if we go back to the end of Monday's lecture, we talked about those um, molecules that have less than an octet, like boron and aluminum, beryllium. Why do they get by with less than that? Because their formal charges end up being zero when they do. 
Why can we get hypervalent molecules like sulfur hexafluoride, phosphorus pentafluoride? Same deal. Sulfur has six valence electrons. If it makes six bonds, its formal charge goes to zero. Phosphorus has five valence electrons. If it makes five bonds, its formal charge goes to zero. So if we can get everything to zero, that's the most ideal. If we can't, then we need to look at some other alternatives, some other options. And the one that is going to make the most sense is the one that gives us the least formal charge and the formal charges in the correct places. And what we mean by that is electronegativity has to factor in. If I have an element that is electronegative, it's going to have a negative formal charge more often than it has a positive one. So if I look at these three structures, I can see that this one over here on the right is the worst of the three. None of these molecules or excuse me, none of these atoms have a zero formal charge. And there are options where zero formal charges are possible. So this is the least likely of the charges. This is the least likely of the ways that that molecule can be constructed. Now, structure A and structure B look very, very similar. They both feature a zero, a positive one, and a negative one. How do I choose between the two? Here's where our electronegativity information comes in. I can look at the periodic table and see that oxygen's more electronegative than nitrogen is. So as a result, we would expect that that negative one charge would rest on an oxygen more often than on a nitrogen. And so if I compare the two structures, I can see that structure A has the negative one on the oxygen and a positive one on the nitrogen, as opposed to the negative one on the nitrogen, the positive one on the nitrogen, and no charge on the oxygen. Since oxygen is more electronegative, it is gonna stabilize that negative charge more. Structure A, is the most likely of the three structures. Now, because structure B is not that far off, in organic chemistry, we would call that a minor structure. Such things can exist sometimes where the two are kind of close to each other. And we would say that, okay, well, you know, maybe 95% of the time it's structure A and 5% of the time it's structure B. But for our purposes, we're not going to look at it that way. We're going to look at it as kind of an absolute. Structure A is the most common structure. It's the structure that we're going to associate with this molecule. It's the most correct. These other structures Yes, they obey the rules. Yes, they are valid in the sense that they've got all the correct numbers of electrons. They all obey the octet rule. But there are other versions available that are better. And so if we were in a quizzing situation or in an exam situation, I would give you partial credit for drawing C. I would give you more partial credit for drawing B, but you would not get full credit unless you gave me A because it's the best of the three. All right, let's take a look at another example. Here we've got nitrogen dioxide, NO2. 
We want to draw the resonance structures of NO2 that have the formal charges closest to zero. So let's start with our math. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. Each oxygen has six. So that's a grand total of 17 electrons. So right off the bat, we know a couple of things. First of all, 17 valence electrons, we know that we are not going to get a full octet on all of the atoms because you can't make an even number out of odds. So something is going to be short an electron. Now, what we also know based on electronegativity, oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. So we know nitrogen is going to be the center atom. We also know that because oxygen is more electronegative, it's not going to be the one that's short an electron. Because it draws electrons to itself. That's the whole point of electronegativity. So as we're drawing this, we're going to start off with our simple structure and we're going to fill the octets And if we do that and count everything up, we would get two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. So this simple structure has 20 electrons in it which means we're three over. Now, one of those three, we can already explain. We know that we need to remove an electron from somewhere and chances are good it's gonna be the nitrogen. But the other two mean that we are needing an extra bond. This is where the resonance is gonna come in because if I redraw my structure, again, starting in simple terms, I know I need to add an extra bond. Does it matter if I add it to the left-hand oxygen or to the right-hand oxygen? No. In the end, we're gonna end up with a double-bonded nitrogen to oxygen and a single bonded nitrogen to oxygen. Its placement is arbitrary. That's the very definition of resonance. So just for the sake of argument here, we're gonna just put it here on the left, knowing that we could easily put it on the right as well. And when we draw its resonance structure, we'll do just that. So I've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. And now I gotta figure out where do those three electrons go? I could either put them a pair on the nitrogen and a single dot on the oxygen or I could put the pair on the oxygen 
and the single on the nitrogen. This is where, again, we're, we're kind of facing that arbitrary choice. This is where formal charge would come in and make a difference. So if I'm calculating formal charges, for the oxygen on the right, it's gonna be the same each time. Six valence electrons minus six dots minus one bond is negative one. So this has a negative one charge. This one has a negative one charge as well. For this oxygen on the left, in the top structure, six valence electrons, three dots, two bonds, that would be a positive one charge here. And for the nitrogen in the middle, it would be five valence electrons minus two dots minus three bonds for a formal charge of zero. So in the top structure, I have a nitrogen with no charge and an oxygen with a positive one charge. Now we just talked about in the beginning, this is probably the less likely scenario. Nitrogen is more, is more electropositive, less electronegative. Oxygen is more electronegative. We would think that the negative goes on the oxygen. We've got a negative on the oxygen there. But let's compare. For the oxygen on the left here, six valence electrons minus four dots minus two bonds is no charge. So I have no charge on the oxygen there. For the nitrogen, I have five valence electrons minus one dot and three bonds, positive one charge as a result. So given what we know about electronegativity, we would conclude that this bottom structure is the better one. Why is the bottom structure the better one? Well, we can't get zeros for everything. So this one and the one above it both do its best to minimize the zeros or get as many as zero as possible. What the bottom structure does better is it gives the more negative charges to the more electronegative atoms. So in this case, both of the oxygens that are single bonded are negatively charged. That part is even. The difference between them, I have a positive to assign and a zero to assign. The zero is more negative than the positive is it's going to go on the more electronegative atom. That's going to be the oxygen. That means the bottom structure is more valid. So as far as resonance structures are concerned, to draw the resonance structures, I would need to show this structure that we drew on the bottom showing the double bond as being on the left and as being on the right. I just bracketed up to show that they are equivalent. Any questions here about this problem with nitrogen dioxide?
All right, so the last concept that we want to talk about here out of chapter four just concerns the idea overall about bond length and bond strength. Now, we talked a little bit about this when we talked about ozone. The idea that the reason we know resonance structures exist is the fact that when we look at a substance like ozone and we see two different types of bonding, yet equivalent bond distances, that must mean that there's some kind of electron movement taking place. Because normally, a double bond and a single bond are going to appear different from each other. A single bond is going to appear longer because there's less attraction between the nuclei. And it's going to be weaker because there's less attraction than the nuclei. And a double bond is going to appear shorter and stronger for the exact same reasons. They're sharing four electrons instead of two. They're going to be drawn to each other more as a result. So the distance between two atoms is referred to as the bond length. The number of bonds that actually exist is something called bond order. And so in structures such as these, like oxygen or peroxide, we can see that the bond orders here are two and one. Two for the double bond in oxygen, one for the single bond in the hydrogen peroxide. In resonance structures, bond order is equal to the number of bonds divided by the number of directions. So what well, I mean by number of directions, how many different exterior atoms are participating in that resonance. So in the case of ozone, I have a total of three bonds, a double bond and a single bond. Three bonds in total being shared over two bonding directions, the two different oxygens that are spoking out from that center. So my bond order would be three halves or one and a half. And if I look at the length of that ozone bond, I can see that it fits between the single bond and its length of 148 and the double bond and its length of 121. Again, that's how we have evidence to show that resonance is a real phenomenon. The fact that the two bond lengths are the same and the fact that their actual bond distance doesn't fit into either category individually, fits into a space in the middle. So what we need to know about this as far as kind of trend is concerned the relationship between bond order and bond length is inverse. As the number of bonds goes up, the length of the bond goes down. We talked a little bit about bond energies already, how much energy it takes to break that chemical bond. The important part here to look at is this statement there. <clears throat> as bond energies, or excuse me, as the bond order goes up, so does the bond energy. So a single bond has a set amount of energy. A double bond requires more energy. A triple bond requires even more energy.
So kind of putting this in summary, When our bond order goes up, as we go from a single bond to a double to a triple, our energy increases and our length decreases. And so that's the last concept that we want to talk about out of this chapter. In your homework for chapter four, you may see a few questions about this, kind of relating these three concepts to each other, just in a kind of comparative way. In the quiz for chapter four, you will definitely see a question relating bond order, bond length, and bond strength. And it'll be along these same kind of lines. I'll give you a picture. You tell me which one has the strongest bonding, which one has the weakest bonding, which one's the the, the, the largest bond, which one's the smallest bond, that kind of thing. <clears throat> All right, any questions about chapter four before we put it away? 